during sutra class we're talking, uh, not sutra class, try to change it to dharma class because we're, we don't always do a sutra, we never have always done a sutra. Um, I started off with an idea, I keep waiting for people to suggest things. And I don't know, am I that intimidating that nobody wants to suggest anything? I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on all the time. But I started off with a, a notion of talking about uh, retreats and how they started in Buddhism and then they moved into China, what happened there, and eventually moving into Korea and then finally into Japan, kind of comparing what's going on as far as the spirit. So that's where we're at. Today, we, we didn't make a whole lot of progress. We got had to do what I call housekeeping. Things going on here, and we don't always get a chance to talk about it. But uh, we have arrived in China, I will say that. And uh, we haven't arrived at Bodhidharma yet, but we will eventually make it there. But I, I'm always trying to come up with a, a, new, a new topic, a new idea for a talk, which you have to understand after four decades, it becomes more and more difficult to come up with a, a talk that I haven't already done six or seven times. And uh, I'd like to go to the Japanese because our exposure in America to Buddhism is Oh gosh, I don't know. I don't think anybody's ever done a study, although Tricycle Magazine probably has pretended to do a study. Uh, we used to get Tricycle here for a couple of years. One of our monks paid the subscription fee. And if you didn't know, there actually is a Buddhist magazine out there called Tricycle. And I'm sure that you can look it up on the internet if you want something. And uh, I got tired of the complaining at it, actually, to tell you the truth. People complaining about this and that and everything else, and I thought, well, that's okay, I've had enough of that. But uh, at one time I thought, oh gosh, 99% of the Buddhism that has arrived in America is Japanese. I don't know what really what it is. I do know that having gone to Seattle and up in parts of Washington, because I have students up there, that there's a strong Tibetan presence up there. <coughs> and uh, there's some there's Tibetan presence kind of scattered through the United States. So, uh, but again, I, I really don't know what the percentages is. I do know, and I've said this before, that used to be when I did some traveling, when I got into a town, the first thing I did is I'd look in the phone book, the non-existent phone book today, but the phone book back then, and I would look to see what Buddhist temples were in the town or not in the town. And sometimes I would see an old friend in there with a temple. Just out of curiosity, I never went to any of them because by nature I'm basically shy, which is hard for people to accept, but it's true, it's true. And uh, I'm the guy at a party that stands in the corner, you know, and watches people having a good time. But uh, I've mentioned it before, when I, when I first uh, put on the robe, I put it on in a Japanese temple. And uh, I lived in that temple for a few years. And one of the things that the teacher there thought would be good for us to be exposed to was the Japanese tea ceremony. And uh, I just went along with whatever the teacher suggested. You know, we're going to have Japanese tea ceremony. Okay, what do I have to do to prepare for that? And there were a few simple items that I had to purchase. Not a lot of money bowl, that was the most expensive thing. Every tea bowl in the Japanese ceremony is unique. 
in that you go out and you buy your own T-bowl. And uh, mine unfortunately broke because I was enamored with a T-bowl that had very thin walls on it, which is, means that it's not going to be very durable, kind of like us. And so one day it died. And, uh, but I, I uh, took instruction in the Japanese terrorist tea ceremony for a while. And, uh, and having read some D.T. Suzuki, I'm not sure how much I got out of that, but having read a few of the books by D.T. Suzuki, I was aware of other things. And uh, they, they all are of the flame, same flavor. If you think about uh, bonsai, now, I know that you know what bonsai is. If I were to ask you, you would probably tell me it's a small tree growing in a small pot. How come you know that? Right. You don't live in Japan, <laughs> right? Anybody have a bonsai at home? Anybody? He does. Okay. If you look at the Webster's current version of the Dictionary of the English Language, you will find the word Zen. I'm not sure what the definition in there is. It's been a long time. But it basically is talking about something that's very simple. And we say things are Zen, or things are Zen-ish, or they have the, the heart of Zen. We, we go through a whole variety of things to describe this. But what does that mean when we say something Zen? It's probably easier for us to say bonsai. Bonsai is an expression of the Zen way of looking at things. Because Zen on one aspect of Zen is as a way of looking at things. Now, for Americans, for the most part, they don't know much about ikebana. Ikebana is flower arrangement. If I say that ikebana is a direct expression of Zen, close your eyes and see if you can visualize what Zen would mean to flower arranging. Is it a big bouquet like you'd send to the hospital when your friend is in the hospital? Or is it perhaps one or two or three flowers with a few decorative branches from a bamboo stuffed in next to it? What do you think Zen would mean to flower arrangement? Well, first of all, Zen implies simplicity. Okay. Whether we call it Zen, or Chan, or Tian, it implies simplicity. If I say to you, tea ceremony, now, I will invite you, as I usually do at the end of our world service today, to come down and have some tea and a cookie with us. It is not a tea ceremony that we participate in, is it? No, because you'll get a cup of tea, you'll drink that cup of tea, and maybe if you're bold, you'll get up and you'll get another cup of tea. <laughs> and you might say, this is real, we have a lot of types of tea here. One of the things that I've wanted to do for the longest time and have not done, and I'm somewhat limited now, <clears throat> and what I can do, because I get winded. <laughs> it doesn't take much to win me. All I've got to do is get up from here and walk to that door, and I start getting winded. And there's not a doggone thing I can do about it. But years ago, I taught meditation at a, at a uh, spiritual gathering that would last for 12 days. And I was asked to come and teach that meditation every morning. And at the end of the meditation, people would go out and have tea. And everything was good for the first few days until the instructor at this said, Oh, you, you, you cannot, you're, you're tying up my students. They need time to go and 
and, and she had a whole list of things they had to do, you know, like brush your teeth and pick their toes. And she just came up with this long list of things because they would come out. I had one hour. I was given one hour. If I went over an hour, I had committed a grievous sin. I had to go to the local Catholic church and confess. And so I went out and I got a cup of coffee because they had coffee made there. But they had every kind of tea in the world. They had this little, it was, it was like out of a tea shop, just all these teas. And people would go up there and they'd get their chamomile tea and their, their this tea and their that tea and their sleepy time tea. And, their, and we used to have some, a couple very wonderful women that were involved in our temple here for years. And they kept showing up with all these teas. None of them were tea. Tea is actually a plant, but they would show up with all of these different teas. Some of them were pretty good, and uh, I didn't know how to display them. We had drawers full of teas, and I, after I did that uh, every morning for so long, and she came out and she said, you, you can't do that. You're, they're stopping to have coffee with you. They want to talk to you, and I thought, this is bad. Well. Yes, it was, because they only had an hour to go and do whatever it is she thought they should be doing before they came back for breakfast. But I keep thinking of that wonderful little corner where all the teas were there. In the tea ceremony, you're not given a choice of tea. I want to describe the tea hut. We ought to build a tea hut here. It would get almost no use at all. Matter of fact, years ago I had a student, a wonderful student, who decided where our cabins are over here, that I should have an interview room. He felt that uh, I needed a traditional interview room that was not my bedroom, although I have to tell you, in Japan, most of the time when you go for interviews, you go to the Roshi's bedroom. It's his room. But he wanted it, and he came up with this idea of, I don't know how well it would survive the winters here, he wanted to have the, the sliding doors with the, you know, the paper screens on them so and all of that soji, kind of stuff. Soji screens? Huh? Soji? Soji screens? Soji, yeah. 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 Soji. Yeah, he wanted to do all of that and have to Tommy. I mean, it all really sounded neat, and, and at that time he was bringing a woman with him who I have not seen in, I don't know, 30 years, 35 years, and uh, she, she had a million dollars in the bank. I only know this because she told me she did, yeah, that she felt it after she left her home and her father, who was a stockbroker with a very famous stockbroking firm, that she felt she needed to have a million dollars so that she could feel comfortable. I'd like to have a million dollars so I could feel comfortable. So he tried to talk her into building this room. And he said, well, guests could sleep in it. Well, we didn't have cabins at the time. But that's a, that's a great simplicity right there. Uh, you know, you know why the Japanese build their houses out of paper and wood, right? Earthquakes. Constant earthquakes. So when you have a wood house built out of paper and wood, when the earthquake's over with you, you can go pick it back up and put it back together, as long as it doesn't catch on fire. <laughs> so somewhere along the line, a Zen practitioner came up with the Zen hut. Now the only thing that happens in that Zen hut is the Zen tea ceremony. I've never read that the tea master sleeps in the hut. It's just a, a simple room, a small room. It could be one of our cabins. One of the distinctive features of it is it has a little alcove. Not real deep, but a little alcove. And in that alcove is put a precious piece of artwork. It could be a calligraphy. 
It could be a drawing or a painting. It could be a piece of pottery. It could be a flower arrangement that the master had put together. But it is typically one thing. And the master usually has, I don't, don't ask me where he keeps his stuff, where she keeps his stuff, but they have a collection of beautiful things and they'll pick something to put there and it'll stay there for a while and then they'll rotate it out and put something else there. When you come in for the tea ceremony, in the middle of the floor there's a charcoal brazier, a burner, and it's there so you can heat water. And they have a cast iron pot that they heat the water in. And uh, I suppose somewhere in Japan there's a company that makes these for the very few tea masters they have. They probably cost a lot of money since they're not selling very many of them. But when you come in there, you have in front of you, if you're used to doing this tea ceremony, you brought with you your cup. Each cup is individual. You pick a cup that speaks to you. And the master doesn't have a cup in front of him. And he takes your cup and he puts in that cup powdered tea, powdered green tea. Now, without getting too carried away here, I have to tell you that tea has been consumed in three different forms traditionally. The first form is what's consumed by the Tibetan monks. They eat it. They take the tea and they mix it with yak butter, yum, and they eat it. The second form is that they take it and they steep it, like we do. And the English and everybody else, they take the tea, they put it in hot water, and they let it infuse the water with the wonderful taste of the tea. Between the eat it and the steep it is the powdered form of tea. They take it in a mortar and pestle and they grind the tea leaves, which have been dried by the way, down to a fine, fine powder. And uh, I didn't know I was going to give this talk until we were in the middle of doing homework and talking a little bit about Zen in China, or I would have grabbed it. I have a couple articles still from my days as a youngster uh, studying the tea ceremony. One of them's a little bamboo scoop. And Mung asked me one day, what is this for? And I said, well, that's for measuring how much tea you put in your teacup during the tea ceremony. And another time I have, there's a little whisk. It's, it's only about that big, and it's made out of bamboo again. And it has fine little, you know, think of what a whisk is. Now, and you take that. So what you do is you take a scoop of this tea and put it in your tea bowl and you fill it with hot water and then you take your whisk and you whisk it until it's completely mixed and frothy. And that's your tea. And that's the second way the tea was consumed a very, very long time ago. And when you're doing the tea ceremony, you, the tea master hands you the tea and by the way, the teacups are quite large, because you can imagine if you, the little teacups we use, if you tried to whisk it, it'd be all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. So, no, it's quite large, and you can mix it up in there just like you're making pancakes. Mm -hmm. And then you drink the tea, two hands, always, and you take three drinks of the tea, and the last drink you take, <laughs> you slurp. <laughs> And you slurp it to indicate how delicious it is. Mm -hmm. And then you set your teacup down. And if there's more than one person, the second cup of tea is made. And the, we go through the same procedure. And then the tea master 
has a little sweet. Anybody here ever had Japanese candy? No. Nope. You have? It's very spicy. The one I have, very spicy. <laughs> yeah, it's not anything like our candy, is it? No. It's no. Not. Very spicy, he said. Yeah. And the tea master will offer you a little bit of candy to kind of clean your palate. And then you bow to each other and you leave. And that is the Japanese tea ceremony. Now, as you're coming into the room, I, I got ahead of myself. One of the things about the tea hut or tea room is, and it's usually a freestanding room, is that you cannot walk through the doorway. Now, think of your typical Japanese. Now, nowadays, the typical Japanese is the same height as me and him. They've all gotten big, and it's, it's suggested that they've gotten big because their diet has changed. One thing is they get lots of vitamins, right? And so they, they've gotten taller and taller and taller. But at one time they were pretty small people. And so now imagine that they come to the door and they purposely made the door lower than the average person that goes through it so that they have to bow down and basically humble themselves to get into the tea room. There's a certain awkwardness to it. The second thing that takes place is as they come into the tea room, they go in front of this alcove and they look at whatever it is. They stand there for a few moments and look at the calligraphy or the ink drawing or the flower arrangement or the piece of pottery, or could be found art, could be a beautiful stone that the master has put there. And they look at that. And then they finally sit down on the tatami and wait for the water to boil. And when the water boils, then the master makes the first cup of tea and then the second cup of tea. There's a story, and it's quite famous in Japan, about a tea master that had a beautiful garden of mums. And the, his tea house was out behind the house he lived in. And to go from the house he lived in, or to go from the gate on the side of the house he lived in, you know, where you're going to visit the tea room, you walk to this gorgeous, gorgeous, Garden of Mums. The Japanese, by the way, love mums. They use them in their calligraphy and in their insignias. You know, they like all kinds of insignias on things. And he received a letter from a state official telling him that he would be arriving on a certain day and he expected the master to give him a tea ceremony. I, I point out that he didn't ask if he could have a tea ceremony. He told the master that he would have a tea ceremony and that he was coming because it was the right time of year to see all the mums. And the master was famous, famous for the, his basically backyard. It was gorgeous and full of all these beautiful yellow mums. And the day before, this government official was, a, was to arrive, the master went out and cut down every mum except for one. And when the official arrived, he wasn't very happy. He came in, had to stoop to get through the door. He was even more unhappy because he'd never been to tea ceremony. And when he looked in the alcove, there was nothing there. And the first thing out of his mouth to the master was, why don't you have a beautiful piece of artwork in the alcove? And the master said, it's outside in the yard. So 
So simplicity is what happened. And the pra practice of Zen is about simplicity. It's not about cutting down flowers. It's not about being better than somebody else. It's not about having titles. It's certainly not about a million dollars. This poor girl that I described, she wanted to be a nun, but she didn't want to cut her hair. That's a talk for another time. The nun that wouldn't, didn't want to cut her hair. But that's what I decided today, because I never could come up with titles. I can work off the title alone. But I want you to think of what it means to you when you hear something and you hear about Zen. Simplicity is really what you think of. The one thing I didn't talk about was the rock garden. And I thought today, we've never, there's never been a, well there was, there briefly was a place that we could have had a rock garden. And we put cabins in it. And Mung keeps talking to me about the backside of, of our Dharma Hall. That he wants this and he wants that. And I had mentioned one time to have a reflective garden back there and, and uh, things like that. And we could put a rock garden back there. It's really the only flat piece of ground we own. And it kind of helps to have a flat piece of ground when you're putting a bunch of rocks on it. But if you think about the things you've seen, and you've, everybody's seen a picture by now of Japanese temples, and they always want to show you their rock garden. And all it is is rocks, right? And, and, and gravel of different sizes. And they put designs in it. And it's usually maintained by one monk. And it's pure simplicity. And it usually represents the ocean and islands. But it's pure simplicity. Can you make your life simplicity? Or does it always have to be complicated? If it always has to be complicated, you want to look into that. Look into the heart of that complication and see if you can find the simplicity. That great master cut down all his flowers but one, trying to get the message across to this very, very important, self-important person. Did it work? We have no idea. We're never told in the story whether the city official or the government official really understood what the master was doing. But teachers have told a story to try to get across to their students. There was a great poem, poet, not poem, poet, known as Ryokan. He's probably the most famous of the Soto Zen masters. And Ryokan talked about the wonderful possessions that he owned the great wealth that he had. He was given a temple to live in, and he refused to live in it. He lived in a shack behind the temple. And he had one robe and one bowl. And he wrote poems about that. And one night, a bandit came to rob him. Couldn't have been a very smart bandit because he went to this little shack behind the temple. And he broke in. And as he was looking for something, there was nothing there. And Ryokan arrived. And he said, what are you doing? He says, I'm robbing you. He says, I don't have anything. He says, I don't understand. And Ryokan took off his robe, his monk's robe, and gave it to him and said, here, this is all I have to give you. And the bandit went away. And Ryokan looked at the sky and saw the moon and said, only if I could have given you the moon would you have had something.